Hello, everybody. How are we doing today? Welcome to the Envirometics panel about health and climate change. Dr. Jay Lemery, thank you so Hello. much for being here. I really appreciate it. Great so, here. thank you. Let's talk about your bio doctor, author, wilderness medicine, climate change. Kind of explain who you are and, and what we're doing here today. Uh, so, I'm ADD, as you can probably tell, like probably most people in the room. Um, but I'm, uh, I'm an educator, and that's really what kind of ties all these things together. I started off um, teaching emergency medicine, which is how I make my living uh, in Colorado. And then shortly thereafter, I got really excited about wilderness medicine because it was a cool way to teach students and uh, care providers how to be effective um, anywhere in the world, you know, without, when the power goes out, how do you still diagnose with your hands and when you're not beholden t to technology, which is a big trend, obviously, in education. <clears throat> we were in New York after 9-11, so there was a lot of disaster response. It was uh, a lot of global health issues, and so I, I dove in hard there. Um, and it was exciting, and we were going to cool places. We were working in Greenland and Antarctica and these remote and beautiful places. And then it was around, it's about 10 years ago, it was around that time where the science began to get politicized and bashed and um, maybe a little warped. Lots of people were saying, well, you know, the data isn't that good, and what do we really know about science anyway? And that really bothered me, because I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. If it's okay if we want to disagree on policy, if your family's from West Virginia, and they are dependent on coal mining, fair enough. Okay, let that, we have to talk about policy, but let's not start to pretend that none of this is happening because then we're all dumb. And so um, that voice within me grew and I began to think about like wh wh why the conspicuous absence of, uh, you know, of physicians and healthcare providers, because we have a very powerful voice. Um, and so that's kind of what, what got me this far. So I just want to say thank you so much for the work that you do because I feel like it's so important. And also thank you for allowing me to be a part of your book because I feel like that's the aspect of climate that people don't want to pay attention to. So can you kind of explain what do you feel like the biggest challenges are when we come to the concept of environmentics and how the environment you know, affects our health? <clears throat> yeah, so I think the first thing you do is have to do a little inventory. Um, and so when we think about what we're seeing in the environment, what's changing, what the data tells us, you know, earth scientists and so forth, we have to say, okay, what is that doing to our weather? Um, it's making days much hotter for much longer in places where it hasn't been that hot. Um, so we're seeing ex extreme heat events take place, right? <clears throat> people say, well, how many people are dying of heat strokes? That's actually not the right metric. It's not just heat strokes. The thing about climate change is it's a threat multiplier to health. So it makes bad things worse. And there's a great study out of the Harvard School of Public Health that says for every one degree centigrade increase in ambient temperature, the death rate for people with comorbidities, right? So heart failure, heart disease, diabetes, uh, people kind of already, you know, held together with, you know, safe, uh, uh, duct tape or safety uh, and safety pins, right? Very tenuous. The death rate goes up by two to four percent for every one degree centigrade. So these are vulnerable people. Um, and I think if so, we'll keep talking. But I think if there's one thing I'd love everyone in this room to understand is climate change is a disease of vulnerability. Right? We're all going to be fine in this room. It's, but it's the vulnerable people who are going to get pummeled. Um, and that's socioeconomic vulnerability, physiologic vulnerability, so the very young, the very old, the very sick. Um, and so let's keep going. So we've talked about extreme heat events <clears throat> and heat waves. Um, uh, critters love heat, right? They thrive in heat. That's why in the tropics there's critters everywhere, and in Greenland there's no snakes, for instance, right? And so we're seeing vector-borne disease, malaria, dengue, yellow fever, uh, Lyme disease, all increasing in latitude and altitude to historically naive populations, right? So people that have never had to worry about getting malaria, um, they've never had it before, so their uh, ability to get more sick from getting it the first time is, is palpable. We're seeing it kind of encroach, and you know, this is a big deal in the U.S., we're seeing it in the Southeast, right, that line 
is slowly increasing uh, northward in terms of where these animals can thrive <clears throat> or excuse me, insects can thrive and have more um, life cycles within a season and things like that. So these, you know, with, with the critters come their diseases. We think about extreme precipitation events, right? Um, my parasitology professor in med school talked about a fecal veneer covers the earth everywhere, including this room. But it's thicker in th some places and thinner in the others, right? So, um, and public health has done very well by saying here's where we eat, Here's where we live, eat and grow our food. Here's where we live, and here's where we go to the bathroom. Keeping those things separate is like a bedrock principle of public health. Extreme precipitation events come in and create a big blender. Right? Even in resource-rich places like New York or Boston, we know don't drink the water five minutes after a big rainstorm because the rain over overwhelms the sewage uh, capacity to clean it. Right. But in most of the world, they don't have that robust of an infrastructure, so now this uh, you know, water security becomes compromised. And as we've talked about, you'll uh, increases the um, incidence of infectious disease, or infectious disease and diarrhea, which is still worldwide one of the biggest killers of children, right? So this is real, so extreme precipitation. Um, degraded air quality from wildfires. <clears throat> um, uh, you know, increases uh, spikes of asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, uh, forced migrations, so sea level rise that happens um, in storm surges, we know, pushes people out of their homes, uh, sometimes uh, forever, um, but also times under periods of great stress. One of the most powerful maps I've ever seen is um, the map of the Katrina diaspora. If you remember, Katrina in 2005 was an urban flood, right? It, it, was the, it wasn't quite the, a hurricane with damage, it was an urban flood. And so the whole city was flooded. Um, we saw all these pic horrible pictures, and everyone remembers them. And you can say, okay, well, you know, it was a f the government fumbled, but eventually these people got help, and they did. FEMA came in and helped them. But if you look at that diaspora map of where those people grew up and where they live now, it's just, you know, it's like a uh, Jackson Pollock painting across the map of the U.S. It's just splattered everywhere. Those people had to move. They had to move under very stressful situations without many resources. So we're seeing this climate... Um, uh, the potential for climate refugees. And as we know, as sea level slowly rises, you know, these Pacific Island nations, they're gone, right? They're already resettling in New Zealand and Australia, right? So this is very stressful, right? And this is a health issue. It's a public health issue. Forced migrations are well documented as ca causing incredible amounts of morbidity and mortality. So that's just some of them. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's quite a lot. Um, and I feel like people don't think about the climate in that type of way, and that's why it's so important to have this conversation, especially here at Emma. But back to air quality and asthma, do you feel like an extensive amount of smog and pollution in a city or CO2 can cause you know, a small child to develop asthma at an early age, or do you feel like it's unrelated? Oh, yeah, I mean, the data is very good on this, right? Air quality and childhood asthma. You know, and, and in the book, that's one of the things that we really wanted to focus on is how is this book different than what's out there? We actually wrote a textbook, and um, it's funny, students tell me, you know, I read your textbook, and I know they're lying because no one reads a textbook. It's 670 yeah. pages yeah. of just wonkery, really dry science. But then, but this other book, Environmetics, we we're like, we have to do a better job. Like, no one is talking, no one, no one, we're not doing, being successful. And so we put on our white coats and said, we're going to take you, the reader, to the bedside. We're going to tell you exactly what this feels like. And again, it's a threat multiplier. These, most part, they're not new diseases. It's making bad diseases worse. So one of the big vignettes was, um, it was the hottest day of the year in the South Bronx, and Sally ran out of her inhaler. And it was, you know, historically, it was only one week a uh, year where it was this hot. Now it's the whole summer. And we take the reader through, you know, a visceral uh, sweat uh, experience, a sweaty child turning blue in front of you, and to explaining how this child needs to be intubated on the street of the South Bronx and then rushed to the closest hospital. It's, 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 it's somewhat melodramatic, but we also, it, it was from our point of view, it was a frustration. Like, we have to tell these stories, you know, composite stories from the, you know, the annals of emergency medicine, because we're not getting it across. So that was, that was the real attempt of this book, was to um, make sure that the reader, there was no pay, uh, no more wonder as to what the effects of this are. Um, so and that they're just very real. 
you know, and I feel like we all need to pay attention much more. And what places do you feel like, to the standards that you are looking at this problem through the lens of the book, um, what places do you feel like are the most in danger right now or will be in the coming future? Yeah, I mean, excellent question. It's, uh, that's a complicated question, but I think I can answer it simply. It's the places that are most vulnerable. Places of poor governance, um, places with very poor resources, um, you know, no public health service, no, um, uh, you know, lack of financial resources. You know, some say, for instance, the Middle East, right, that's a multifaceted, crazy uh, geopolitical problem, but some say it was very much correlated with the worst drought in Lebanon and Syria in over 900 years. And that's NOAA. You know, that's our, that's our federal science agencies telling us this. And the worst drought, you know, so you had farmers moving into the cities, which stoked, you know, the, the Arab Spring, things like that. So it's a, it's a vulnerability issue. What we saw ha happened in Puerto Rico, um, again, you know, it was, it was a vulnerable place. It's part of the United States, but we all know it's different, right? It's a different, it's a whole different culture, and they have a different uh, form of government, really. Um, those people suffered um, because, again, there was, a vul there was a baseline vulnerability and they got pushed over. One of the stories I like to talk about is where I trained. So I trained in New York City. I trained at Bellevue Hospital, um, an amazing place, the public safety net hospital for New York City. Uh, there's no locks on the doors. It's been open since 1730-something. It takes care of the immigrants, the prisoners, um, the homeless, and that's a point of pride. Like that was. That was what the hospital does. The most resource rich, arguably, place in America, right, had a storm surge from an extreme weather event, and it knocked the hospital offline for nine months to a year, depending on how you define it, right? Crazy. These people had, uh, they could go to other emergency rooms, but for anyone who knows, emergency medicine is not the same as primary care. Very, very different, different missions altogether. So, the we don't know the data, but we know all these people had tremendous, and these are vulnerable people, right? It's not like they're gonna say, come back next Tuesday. It, 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 we know these people don't have the, the mental or physical capacity to just follow through like that. Um, and so that's a perfect example of, you know, a vulnerability happening in a place where you just don't, you think everyone is, is uh, gonna be fine because it's a wealthy city with relatively, comparatively good governance, right? And so. Very powerful. That's just that's that's just so shocking how much the environment can really pose as a threat to us, you know. And I feel like, do you feel like when people talk about the environment just in a normal place in a coffee shop or if they're having a conversation, they see something on the news? Do you think that they're thinking about these aspects of it? Yeah, great question. I think you answered it right. Yeah. Um, you know, all too often we go to polar bears. Yeah, uh, we go to love Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. um, sci scientists will t take us another direction, so that you know that, that's the the altruistic. Science will take us to the abstract. You know, 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide just exceeded at Mauna Loa, right? For those that know what this means, it's a big deal, right? It's 400 big threshold. For most of the public, it means nothing. It could be 500. It could be one. It could be a million. Like, mm -hmm. makes no sense, right? Yeah. So. They don't, I don't think so. And I'm shocked because even th those in the medical community don't get it. They're like, really? I had no idea. Yeah. Amazing, right? So I think if we can uh, tweak the narrative to make it person-centric, um, and I say this just because I'm, I'm focusing on the end. I want people to understand the risk, and I want change from that understanding. So if this is what it takes, great. Luckily, I'm in a place where I can speak somewhat authoritatively about health, right? Um, but we're a selfish species, and if this is what it takes to get us to pay attention, um, so be it. And I also think, you know, the, the one thing we um, wanted to bring forth is, is, is that white coat effect, right? So all day long, I sit at the bedside, and, you know, I've got 10 minutes with a patient, and we're trying to put, put it together. 
and I translate abstract science, you know, I say, Jaden, you know, okay, so you got to take aspirin because the heart, the plumbing of your heart could get blocked. I see if you a heart attack, we want you to take aspirin because it kind of keeps the plumbing from getting blocked. Makes sense? Great. And what do you say? Yeah, okay. yeah, makes sense. You say, okay, doc. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Like, well, okay, doc, right? Yeah. We still have the public trust in a way that other professions in the age of cynicism, more cynical every day, we still have that public trust. So people say, okay, doc. And that's kind of what the approach we want to have is to be like, one, hear it from the people that are some of the most trusted professionals still, and then do it in a manner where um, we can we don't necessarily have to talk like a climate science. I am not a funded climate science. I don't have to be careful in saying, well, confidence intervals, less than 5%. So almost never, probably not. It's easy to beat up scientists because scientists have to live in uncertainties. That's why they're doing science, right? No one's studying gravity anymore, right? They're studying areas of uncertainty. Um, I don't have to do that. And I'm, we in the medical community are very comfortable saying, you know what, maybe, but I'm looking at the preponderance of data, and I know, you know, we know sickness, this is sickness, so we're very comfortable taking that leap forward and uh, getting to conclusions in a much more uh, authoritative manner than a, than a climate scientist, for instance, because the burdens of proof are just totally different, and this is what we do all day long, and frankly, it's, it's a little bit hypocritical to think that we can make decisions for family members and loved ones, life-changing, life-threatening, potentially altering decisions, and yet, you know, there's a whole different burden of proof when we're talking about, you know, um, whether there, you know, it's been a stormier year in the North Atlantic, right? I mean, I think there's a little bit of dis discordance there, so. I feel like almost there needs to be some type of series that is specifically focusing on this. You know, I feel like there should be like an environmental series. Maybe we should work on that and just make it, yes. you know. <laughs> I feel like people need to need to see that, you know. And I'm thinking of just other young people out there in school. I feel like that would be the perfect lens to look at the environment through because you're kind of learning about multiple things at once, you know. Yeah, this, I mean, frankly, this is, this, this is a crap book, right? It can't, it can't be the end of it. Right? Yeah. We, we have to, that can't be the end of the story. And, you know, I was talking to people in the industry, of course, most people in the room, um, cinematographically, cinematographically, I mean, there are some fantastic things to do, right? We can go to the Maldives and, 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 uh, film people's houses that are going underwater. When we were in Greenland, um, it was very interesting. We spoke to the local care providers there, and they said, yeah, what's happening? And, you know, so again, just a spectacular place, which is how I got into this in the first place. Remember, I was sort of chasing remote, cool places to, to provide yeah. care. And um, they're saying, because of the uh, lack of pack ice, um, now the fishing seasons are longer. Um, they're overfishing their waters. They're bringing in more money, but it's not sustainable. It's not like they discovered uh, something that would allow them to, to, to uh, a new source of income in perpetuity. It's like it's a finite source of income. And they're spending all this money, and it's a phenomenon seen worldwide. They're um, having a spike in um, uh, non-communicable diseases, so heart disease, diabetes, obesity and now their health metrics and they're very if you remember Greenland's kind of interesting because it's part of Denmark so it's a nationalized health service there so the health care is actually really interesting it's good in these remote communities but they're like yeah the metrics are all haywire um, than it was 10 years ago and we're not able to keep the population nearly as healthy because of because of this effect so it's just you know these ripple effects these interesting stories where it may not seem intuitive or obvious but again it's um, when taken together Right, this is problematic. It's affecting our health, and I think we have to look at it through that lens. Because I think, in a way, it'll you know, if there's ever a way we're going to break through this impasse, you know, this could be it. Can I just say one more thing? Um, the uh, we have it. We have a track record of this, right? In in health, in the early '80s. Um, when nuclear wars, some of us may remember, became all of a sudden winnable, right? The shift, the, the strategic shift changed, the rhetoric changed, very scary. And um, 
healthcare providers from both sides of the Iron Curtain looked at this in existential, politicized, no individual felt like they had any chance of changing anything, right? Sound familiar? Nuclear proliferation and said, this is a health issue. Like, I don't, and it was both sides of the Iron Curtain. Like, we don't care about anything else. This is a health issue. We need to address it as such. Nuclear war is the final epidemic with no meaningful cure. And because they framed it in that way, they were somewhat un unimpeachable from both of their respective constituencies. And um, they, uh, in the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985 for it, right? So I think we're, this is a similar thing. And I think it's not, it's not a physician thing, it's a pe people thing. If we can frame it as, as a health issue, we have a real chance of, um, you know, moving the needle on it in a way that I, I think generally we've been su unsuccessful. I fully agree. I fully agree. And I just, I think that more conversations need to be had like this because I just, every time that I talk to you, every time I read the book, I think I never look at it in this way. And I'm just so glad that we have an expert like you here to be able to explain these things to us. And you're right. It is, it is a... It is a people thing, and people are going to have to understand it. Is there anyone that has any questions for Mr. Lemery here? If you do, just let us know, because, yes, right here. Um, so um, I know that uh, Manhattan is one of the most sustainable cities in, in the U.S., probably in the world, because of the density, because everyone's looking so uh, closely together, because it's a very walkable city. Um, but it's also you know, part of New York, which probably doesn't have the best air quality. Um, can you talk a little bit about how air quality affects you know places where there's um, dense li like people are living on top of each other? It's very dense, um, and people are walking a lot, not using not using private cars or anything, really relying on public transit. But um, at the same time, you know, air quality is probably not that great there. How, how does that play out? So your question was, um, how does air quality play out in otherwise? Uh, or urban cities which may have a lower footprint. We know cities are actually pretty efficient in terms of suburbs mm. by comparison, right? Um, I, I'm not entirely sure how to answer that. I think the air in Manhattan is actually pretty, um, it's better than, for instance, Denver or Salt Lake City or even LA where you have these big, large basins and very complex things that just sort of sit. Um, but why, why would you say that the air quality is better there than it is here? Because even in Salt Lake City, I've noticed that when I'm there, it, there is times where it's very smoggy. And why does that happen? Right. So that is, and anyone in the room could correct me. I think that's just my understanding of air quality, just from understanding where it's the worst. And I think, mm -hmm. New York, I think Manhattan, New York City is actually pretty good compared wow. to other major American cities. And again, I, I'm not a, climate, um, a climatologist or a weather, or a meteorologist rather, but um, so it's difficult for me to say with certainty, but uh, you, know, you have these things called inversions and you know, heavy uh, days where the air just isn't moving. Mm. And so it collects in these big basins. And I know Salt Lake uh, City is, a, is one of the ones where it's, uh, we see it quite a bit. They often refer to it as you know, the, one of the worst in America. Wow. And in a place like New York City, when people are living on top of each other in such a small place, do you feel like you're more likely to, you know, get asthma at a young age there? Or is it something that's more so in Los Angeles, in a suburb or in Salt Lake? Yeah, those are big generalizations. I think, you know, some of the best asthma studies we know came out of the South Bronx because, but it was also socioeconomic, right? It was where people lived, a heavy concentration of fast moving traffic. Um, and lack of access to good care, lack of access to you know simple inhalers and things like that. So uh, there's complex interplay, but but we know when the air quality degrades, it pushes you know that margin of vulnerability over the cliff, and that's where you're going to see a, a new spike in um, in asthma attacks and for older people complications of heart disease and uh, obstructive lung disease. Wow. Okay. Wow. Good stuff. Good stuff. Can I just finish? So I just say one last thing. Yes. Thank you. Uh, we got to the end of the book, and um, my co-author and I were like, God, this is, this is doom and gloom. Um, I was talking to Debbie. I was like, this, this is a Debbie Downer, present company excluded. Um, and so Jaden came in, and uh, we, had, we were like, you got to finish the book for us, because 
your your generation is going to be the one to fix it. And so you did it. So uh, thanks, because I thought you had a incredibly inspirational message and it's the mobilizing the youth of America which is your constituency thank you just for allowing me to be a part of it and allowing me to be educated through the process you know because the things that I like to work on are the things that I can also learn more about myself and about the world while doing um, so I really appreciate you and I feel like your message is just so extremely ex important and I'm gonna I'm working on an environmental documentary series right now and I think that me and you need to have an episode just like like this where we talk about these these problems it. but thank you all very much that was the environmentics panel with dr jay lemery i'm jaden smith and thank you all very much we really appreciate you